So for me, leadership, it's really anybody that feels called upon to lead is a leader. So according to that definition, leadership, it's about influence, it's about movement. It is really about being genuinely obsessed with the development of others. And I often, in my head, contrast and compare it uh, with management, where management is about getting things done through others, where leadership is about ensuring that the ladder is leaning against the correct wall to start off with. So if you're a good leader, you can't help but talk straight. Start first with the who, then the what. It's about extending trust. You'll find it very easy to recognize, palette, highlight, and celebrate others. So we talk about leadership in a context. So with that, we also have to accept that a leader is a product of your own context. For instance, Holisa Samandela had a particular pain that he had to deal with. Tabombekis was very different. So in work, we normally think of what pain have I been brought here to solve. It's about active listening. You play it back to your own people and you know that you got it right when you can say, so what I hear you tell me is that we're going to turn left one degree. That to me uh, is leadership. I think I've been absolutely blessed with some amazing opportunities. I'm a typical township boy from Katlehong, part of the Katoras area, Katlehong Togwaza Foslores. So we saw some amazing, wonderful, good things. We saw some internal and strife, some wars. Um, but from early on, I always had a sense that I am very comfortable in my own skin. I'm very comfortable with the people that I grew up with. Um, and I was always aware of the fact that I could be anything that I wanted to be. So I went to typical township schools, I uh, went to metric, they call it grade 12 now. Ndatele Pili Taunyana was our principal who end up, ended up being uh, the life president of SAFA. And he imbued in us a culture that said, not even the sky is the limit. Very quickly, I decided I wanted to become a doctor because I looked around the township, the people that lived in the biggest houses, drove the biggest cars at that time, Jaguar, S-Type, V8, with double um, petrol tank was the thing. Uh, Dr. Mzamani, Dr. Paling, uh, those are the people that really motivated and inspired me. So I had options. Most of my friends who were already at medical school, some of them practicing clinicians, had graduated from the University of Natal, went with black section. The apartheid government had created an entire medical school for black students called Medical University of Southern Africa, Medunsa for short. So after passing my fourth year, we then go into our fifth year, we start doing our electives. From second year, you start hanging a stethoscope around your neck. We started delivering babies in Alexander Clinic from year two. So you understood a little bit of anatomy and physiology, and of course you did pharmacology, so you can understand the interactions uh, of drugs, uh, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. And then out of the blue, I realized that, you know, I don't know many senior black executives. I was beginning to engage, interact and interface with a few. This is the lifestyle that I thought could touch many lives at one go, rather than sitting in your surgery as a GP for 30, 45 minutes, seeing one patient at a time. I fell in love with management. I remember I was driving with some friends going up to Vet Bank, and we heard this African over the radio. His name was Lord Madukendlov. He was 
describing affirmative action. He was eloquent. I didn't know him, but you could feel that he was comfortable in old skin. He was assertive. He had facts on the fingers of his fingertips. I said, my God, I want to be like this guy. I learned that he was a manager. And from that moment on, I think I was obsessed with just being a manager. And I, indeed, I ultimately left medical school, went around to say, what can I do with a para-medical uh, background? I looked at pharmaceutical companies. I applied at a company called Pfizer with a P. To cut a long story short, I was their first black professional sales representative. Neville McGregor hired me together with a guy called Barry Scott, who was the marketing director. And the country manager at that time was Mr. Davids. And I spent the most five glorious years because I came in, they didn't know what I was capable of. First, they allowed me an opportunity to study for six weeks um, their products and services. 80% uh, was the mark. I was the first one to ace it for that entire six months, 100%, everything that they put in front of me. Such was the hunger, but most importantly, the motivation uh, based on the fear of poverty. And they gave me a black area, of course. Uh, so we took Atleon Togoza to Duza, Nigel, uh, and the old homelands. Uh, uh, I went up to Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, and Namibia. Every six weeks, I would do this country trips. But at that time, I said, but why are they not allowing me to sell Feldin, which was a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, 28 tablets, at that time cost 320 rand, because they thought our doctors can't afford this unbeknown to them, I went and told the township doctors about this wonder drug uh, for all um, <laughs> muscular diseases, especially inflammatory uh, conditions, osteoarthritis, um, rheumatoid arthritis, but also ankylosing spondylitis. Not only did I sell the knowledge to them, which was what I was required to do, but I said, if you believe in this drug, give me a check now, and I'll come and drop it off myself. I collected 32 checks in one week. We used to meet every Friday to see and review the week that was and plan the week that is yet to be. And right at the end of the me meeting, I reached up into my bag and gave my boss, Neville McGregor, these 32 checks with an order book of Feldin. So he looked at me, his jaw dropped, his eyes went wide. He said, first of all, None of the reps had ever brought the actual check. Number two, we thought you didn't do Feldin during your studies, even though you did 100% of all the modules uh, that you were handling. Not only did you do that, but you could bring 32 of these. This afternoon, you need to go and write the test so that we can have confidence in you that you're representing us as well. It was 4, 4 30. 6.30, I finished, I got another 100%. They took the 32 checks. From that moment on, I was allowed to sell uh, Feldin, which is an ancestral anti-inflammatory drug. And it really embedded in me that initial belief that I could be anything that I wanted. I had an amazing opportunity where I was one of only 22 people in the world whose job it was to look at the three Swiss pharmaceutical companies, Sandoz Products, Siba Gaigi, we left Roche out, to create a new entity called Novo Artis. Today the company is called Novo Artis. We had to write the business case. We had to go to 122 countries and locations, speak to every single solitary one of the CEOs, sell this idea. Once that was done, go and sell it to the global board. And we had to write the synergies for both capital, for cost, and revenue synergies. When that was ticked off, then our job was to live for 18 months in Basel at the confluence of Germany, France, and Switzerland um, and create this entity called Novo Artis. My boss, Vasella, became the group CEO of both entities. Uh, then in my head, I was absolutely convinced that here's a cattle boy, township thug, who could live for 18 months in Basel and really sell something that is tangible and create a company. I was headhunted by um, a Spanish man, Mario Abajo, to be the managing director of the world's biggest and oldest elevator company. Not only was I MD of OT South Africa, 
This was a listed entity on the Johannesburg Securities Exchange. I was MD of Otis Africa. We had a presence in 34 of the then 53, now we've got 54 African countries. I looked after the continent. First three years I reported to Paris, the last two to Madrid. At that time, there was no doubt in my mind, not any single fiber that I couldn't compete with absolutely the best in the world. At that time, Otis Elevators was part of United Technologies Corporation, Hartford, Connecticut. UTC for short, owned Otis, we made lifts. Carrier, they made air conditioners. Sikorsky, they made helicopters. Pratt & Whitney, they made jet engines, PW400, PW800, and Hamilton Sunstrand, environmental products, toilets for the space shuttle, cabins for Apollo 13, and suits that are worn by astronauts. Three of the five were in aviation. Then started my international career, where I didn't have to report in South Africa, but I reported outside. And honestly, at that time, I think, uh, given the total, absolute, final accountability for what happens not only in South Africa, but in the continent, we increased the size of OTs fourfold. By the time I left, we were selling 10,714 lifts just in South Africa. In Dubai, when Dubai started, we're selling 80,000 lifts a week. So I ran Otis for five glorious years, but the stupid patriot in me, I thought the little that we've learned about running global businesses, surely at the end I need to come back and share with the rest of the country. I was looking only at three things. I said, can I, including my company, be a trusted advisor to government and all our stakeholders? be a partner of choice, and do everything possible to make sure that this ANC-led government becomes a capable state. So I thought I'd learned a little bit. So when I was asked by Minister Jeff Hadebe, Minister of Public Enterprises, to say, come and help at SAA, I dropped everything. At that time, the plan was, let me live in Paris, look after the whole of the continent. I had an ailing mother, a mother-in-law and a father-in-law that were not too young. I wasn't very energized. But the prospect of helping one's country to be internationally competitive really helped me. I went in as an executive vice president during Coleman Andrews days. I looked at after three portfolios, global sales, revenue management, and strategic alliances. The one I loved the most, of course, was revenue management, because this was the heart of the business, sending the right aircraft to the right destination with the right capacity, 100 or 377 passengers. Absolutely, absolutely loved it. And I thought I was really making a contribution because we wanted to palette, highlight, and celebrate absolutely the best. But there was only one motivating factor for me. The question I kept asking myself, is it possible for these state-owned enterprises to be run by a South African and still be internationally competitive and profitable at home? And during that tenure that I was at SAA, it was the six years that I spent as a non-executive director on the board of South African Express Airways. And then later on, an extra three years as a non-executive director on SAA itself. Um, that board was chaired by Cheryl Karoulis. That was the only motivating factor. Could be possible that a South African could run any of these state-owned enterprises so that it remains profitable and internationally competitive. I came back when the entrepreneurial bug bit and we wanted to feel what it is like to start our own company. We went to the UK, bought a company called Drake & Skull Integrated Facilities Management. We bought, brought facilities management to South Africa. We started with three employees. The idea was to run it for five years so that we can sell it, so that we don't ever have to work. We failed miserably. At the end of five years, the global recession hit the contingent effect took root, and then we sold only a year later. Just to give you an idea, our BE partner was Nozala. They bought a 22% stake for less than one and a half million rent. They wanted to pay us. We took a loan on their behalf from Ethos Private Equity. When we sold at year six, we were employing 76,000 people. They netted 300 million after servicing their loans and meeting their covenants. So they put in less than two, they took out 300 million rand. We still hold the record of the highest PE multiple that was paid. We're paid 19.7, PE 
PE multiple after tax, 15 times EBIT multiple. That's when we took it a little bit easy, and then I came to join uh, Royal Dutch Shell as the chairman, the group CEO, and the vice president for our sales and operations, looking after the whole area called South. Some of the learnings for me about leadership that I've gleaned, yes, from Shell, but all the other companies that I've had the privilege of leading can be distilled into one or two things. First, I think all of us are called upon to really bring about companies of the 21st century that, one, bring about the enveloping and the accommodation of technology because technology drives um, our thought processes, but also our delivery mechanisms, but also even our models. Number two, those companies that can also concern themselves with building this agility muscle, not only because it rhymes with stability, but because if we can teach our people to think, to evolve solution on their own, then they can jump over the cliff for us. Then they can run these companies on their own. And then lastly, can we develop leaders of the 21st century? Because you can lead today the same way that we were led on the 17th of April, 1984, when I started work. So that if we are lucky, maybe, just maybe, we can bring about the four leadership baseline behaviors. And this really talks to what my grandmother taught me about life in general. First, everything in moderation. In leadership terms, can we facilitate effective team collaboration much more effectively? Because teams accomplish, not individual superstars. Number two, can we demonstrate our absolute obsession for our people? Because if we demonstrate care to them, they will give it back to us tenfold. Number three, can we champion the desired change that we want? In South Africa, we're changing everything. This is not the reformation where the chameleon, depending on the background, it can either be brown or green, depending on the foliage. Here it is absolute metamorphosis that this that we are creating has absolutely no resemblance to the past painful where we come from. This is the pupa that becomes the butterfly. This is the cancer cell that if you look at it under the microscope, it bears no resemblance to a normal cell, but also it doesn't behave like a normal cell. It's about can we fundamentally break with the past and we need to champion that change that we want to see. We can't say it ought to be led bottom up. Of course we consult, we participate, but that needs definition, clarity, leadership, uh, singularity of purpose. And then lastly, can we really provide critical perspectives? As Africans, we are led by leaders that have been in power sometimes for 40 years. From Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, 1957, 60 years later, Ghana is not globally competitive. To Jomo Kenyatta, to Robert Mugabe now, we need to provide that critical perspective that says, what is it that we can do as Africans to contribute to the global international competitiveness. That is uniquely African. And we can't do that like the Japanese did, just by copying everything American, making it better and cheaper and much more cost effectively. Really, it can be. We need to be looking at our own models. We need to be looking at our own resources. We need to be looking at how best we can utilize our talent, our own people. If we did that and did that really very well, there's no reason why Africa can't take its rightful place within the global uh, arena, especially because North America is saturated. If it grows by 2% in the next five years, they'll be celebrating. Europe, 28 uh, member countries, <laughs> even their growth is curtailed, GDP growth I'm talking about, but even their population growth, they are regressing. So the one area that is really growing in the world is Southeast Asia, and of course, uh, some of the uh, old USSR countries. The next is Africa, where there's 1.2 billion people, 54 countries, speaking 2,000 languages. These are the people that are still going to buy cars, white goods, where even if you talk about energy of the 7 billion people in the world, 1.4 billion have absolutely no access to energy. 
642 million of them happen to be in Africa. And yet we have the most God-given resources. Three of the biggest rivers in the world, the mighty Zambezi, happen to be in Africa. So we could have the biggest hydroelectric power um, plants in the world. The sun here shines 12 months out of 12 months in a year. And yet the world authority on solar energy is Germany, where they celebrate when they have three months uh, of energy. And we can use uh, other renewables, wind. We even have towns uh, named after the wind, PE and East London, windy cities in the middle of the ocean, put turbines on top of our mountains where this can generate electricity. Because for me, electricity is the third means of production. When you have good energy, you can have economic growth. When you have good economic growth, then and only then can we talk about the redistribution of wealth, not redistribution of poverty. So if we can focus our time, energy, and effort on the three things that keep us awake at night, the stubbornly high levels of unemployment, Officially, we say 26%. In real terms, we know it's more four out of 10, so 40%. These stubbornly high levels of unemployment then lead to increasing levels of poverty and increasing levels of inequality. And I submit that what leads to social strife and implosion of civilizations is relative inequality. So if we don't tackle that, we won't be able to sleep at night because when your neighbor is hungry, you are the one that can sleep at night. The people would move across the bridge from Alexander to the leafy suburbs of Bryanston to steal from our fridges out of necessity. We have to halt that. When the driving force and the motivation can only be, how is this helping us to improve the quality of lives of the majority of our people? So the way I think about the challenge we are called upon to solve today in this country, in this context, when so many of us dare to hope that joy and peace will prevail. Number one is how do we collectively give effect to the South Africa of Kholisasa, Mandela's dreams? He wanted us to be the greatest nation on earth so that we can achieve in our lifetime this notion of inclusive economic growth. Because in the past we've had 43 consecutive quarters of positive GDP growth but the rich got richer, the poor got poorer. Of course, we made huge progress because every year we added 400,000 families into the black middle class. Thirdly, so that we can realize this nation building. Because we are busy with an unfinished project of building a nation from two desperate worlds, the white world that has and the black world that does not have where poverty is defined just by where you are born and by the color of your skin. So we have to change that. So that lastly, we can achieve this notion of social cohesion, where we are cohesive, we one people with one vision, one country, one endowment. And some of the management principle that arises out of that is when you are given a new company to come in and be a part of is you know that those people don't care so much about what you know. They genuinely care about the fact that you care about them. And in there, we look at positive leadership, bang in the center of everything that we do. Why? So that we can get ordinary people to give us extraordinary outcomes. That's what creating movement, that's what having influence is about. We need men and women with demonstrable track record that are selfless, that work hard that show that they can run businesses first and foremost. Because there are only two means in which countries get their income. Number one in South Africa is the 28% corporate tax. Number two is the 41, now 45% PAYE that comes from people hired by these companies. So to use hateful slogans like white monopoly capital is not helpful at all because there's no country in the world that has ever attempted to do the social engineering that we want to do, to bring millions of people out of poverty by the scruff of their necks into the economic mainstream without government and business and labor and civil society working harmoniously together towards a singularity of purpose. And I'll submit that there is nothing more important than the environment, the culture, 
that will create an environment that says everybody is needed and wanted. Where you feel it, you can touch it, it's palpable. Especially women. Because businesses today are very hostile to women as they are hostile to black people in general. That environment where, like farming, we know that the farmer does not spend 80% of his or her time massaging the individual seeds, but they spend 80% of their time preparing the soil, the environment. So the culture in an organization says, every one of our people, irrespective of age, race, sexual orientation, in a right environment, can bear fruit in abundance. They can thrive. Our job is not to coach individuals to fit in, to teach them what color glass goes with what color wine, that you eat from outside in, that you eat left your bread and you drink right from your glass. That's less useful. What is more useful is to say, can our women feel that they are rewarded for the fact that their mothers at home looking after our children before they come uh, to work, that they drop them off at school, having made sure that their lunch is packed. Therefore, in setting our meetings, it's not useful to have your first meeting at 8 o'clock when you know that they're running around. Why not at 9? The same way that we do on Fridays, that we never set a meeting between 12 and 1 because of our Muslim uh, employees who have to go to mosque. If that is important to us, then it ought to be important to women so that it doesn't feel like a war zone where they have to do a hostile takeover, but that they can make a contribution, they can come up with a fresh and indeed a new perspective. So for me, culture is the mood importante. There's nothing that is much more critical than to prepare that environment, that culture. If we get it right, maybe, just maybe, South Africa stands a chance of being internationally competitive. When you go back to the National Development Plan, we won't grow at 5.4% on the high end, we'll grow at 7%, where every five years we double the size of this economy. Nobody wants to do business with anybody that's not successful. There's no country that wants to partner a poor, beleaguered, strife-torn country, but they want a successful South Africa. And it's within us to be able to do that, every 55 million of us. Mm -hmm.